So why don't I give you a little bit of background about my, my, myself and my company, first of all. Um, uh, just with respect to the work that my company does at Elevate Realty, we basically help investors buy investment properties. Uh, we help them uh, purchase them, we manage them for them, we deal with their um, tax advisory services, we help them plan how they're gonna grow their portfolio, um, and uh, all the property management, leasing, all that stuff that comes with it. So um, that's what we do now. Um, if you asked me five years ago, all I was was a real estate agent and I was selling properties across the city. Um, so a lot's changed in a few years and a lot of that's been just pivoting along the way, kind of figuring out where where the skill set that you bring to the table and what fit for the clients that you're working with. Um, so typically um, we're working with a lot of different types of investors. Most of them come from a professional background. Actually a lot of them are classmates of ours. Uh, Shannon back in the day as well that have just slowly gone to grow their their uh, portfolio so um, that's where sort of my background um, and, you know how how it sort of evolved to the, the, the state where it is and, and the company I'll go into a little bit more about uh, the company over the over the course of the presentation so um, if you go to the first slide Shannon. so um, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself first of all I, I think um, you know I it's, it's been a long time since, you know, it's, it's not that long, but it feels long right now. It does uh, feel long. Yeah, it's been 12 years since I graduated here at, uh, from the industrial engineering program. Um, at the time when, the, and I'll start with the first sort of, uh, first part there is, um, I, in, in the industrial engineering program here, um, I had, I, I loved all the like extracurricular work. I was um, the president of IIEC SIE at the time, it was Canadian Society of Industrial Engineers. And I ran the, uh, what was called MBTC at the time, National Business and Technology Conference uh, uh, back then. So um, did a couple co-op terms at, at Toronto Hydro and I did my PY at Hudson's Bay Company uh, back when they were still a Canadian company. Now they're a US company, so it sucks. But, um, and and what, I, what I would say here is, um, you know, thinking back into, into the sort of my university stage, it's a lot about making the best of the opportunities you have. I, I, I think Shannon and I, we just talked about a little bit here as well. It's, it's the best time to work extremely hard. Um, you don't have a lot of responsibilities and you have the ability to be flexible and absorb like a sponge on everything that's going around you. Um, I think for me, um, I made an effort at the time to really get involved in a lot of extracurricular, which really helped my career. They, they basically set up all my jobs. Um, uh, being involved when I got extra, I wasn't the top student in the class by any means. I will need most a of our help. successful, <laughs> like most successful alumni are weren't either, right? Yeah, there's yeah. only one top of the class. Yeah, there's, there's a whole class yeah. of, and, of and you of work hard. And you kind of go through it and you get through the schooling and 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 then once you're out, you you kind of figure it out. But during during the program, it is it's it's a tough program. Um, it's you know the, the what we go through as engineers from a just being physically in classes in tutorials and labs is over twice what the average university student is going through. So it's a lot, you build a lot of good habits. You are able to grind through and be just extremely disciplined when you're, when you're working on things. So I think that's one of the real takeaways that, that you know, when I, when I think back to university, what it, what it really got to is the fact that you, know, you have the ability to work hard, you know the people that are around you are of the same nature, like they all come from that same background, and you can really leverage that. Those are the people that you're gonna continue to be friends with after the after you're done school. And and I think a big part of it is, is having that network. And for me, it made a huge difference. I'll talk a little bit about, about that uh, more later on. Um, so after I finished uh, finished school, I actually landed my first job at uh, RBC. I was working in consulting there. Um, so in their internal consulting strategy division there, I was there for uh, about two, two and a half years or so. Um, big organization. You're, you know, new grad. You think you think you're ready to kind of jump in and make a huge impact. Uh, Challenge is is that you're not. You're you're very small in the organization. It takes a while to kind of really understand that and understand that there is no no free lunch. That you you pretty much get there and you have to work your way up. And everyone like you know you get paid to do a job and you need to run the reports or you need to do the decks. You need to support people at, at hours that and that's just part of the part of the the role. I found it, um, and, I, I, and I think the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that I found was that being in an organization like that, you are a little bit, uh, and this is again biased because I'm, I'm in a small organization now, 
is that uh, you tend to be focused on very small things and you have to get really good at it, whether it's, you know, preparing, you know, uh, whether it's preparing your financials or whatever it is that you're doing with respect to that organization. You get really good at something narrow, but you don't have a holistic picture of how the organization runs. Um, and so when, it, when you think about working in an organization like that, you don't get a lot of perspectives. You don't get a lot of perspective of what's happening, how to run a company. You, you get really good at what you're doing. And, and that, was the, uh, you know, that was the thing for me that, that really I found um, didn't suit my personality, didn't suit what I wanted to do. You felt you were a little bit pigeon held a little bit in, in that type of organization. Um, and so, and so, you know, I was like, you know what, maybe this is just not the right fit. Um, and if I go to a different organization, it might, it might look a little different. So with RBC, I was there for two and a half years. And subsequently, um, actually Professor Carter, one of our professors oh. here, uh, got me into the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Um, so he, uh, he connected me with the strategy um, uh, deputy, deputy minister there, and I ended up working for him for about three and a half, four years. Um, very interesting work. Uh, government is a completely different world um, but when I say if you get things done slowly at the bank it's like even worse at, in, in a government organization it was, it was very very difficult. I believe that, yeah. yeah very very difficult to get things done and a lot of it is optics a lot of it is you know you don't want to be the front page news so you want to be able to, to sort of manage and 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 make sure that you know the things that you're working on are gonna keep everything quiet keep the keep the, the guys in power in power and, and kind of move from there, right? So it was, you know, politics and dancing around lines a lot of time, not a lot of getting work done. And it was just, you know, having, you know, my perspective, which is working for, you know, HBC, these other larger organizations, I was just, I, I was a little bit frustrated, to be honest with you. And I, it got to the point where I was like, okay, hey, well, here I am, I'm working really hard, long hours, I'm not seeing the fruits of my labor, I'm not sure how I'm impacting. The impact might be five, might be 10 years out. Um, so that's really what triggered a lot of sort of thought, the thought process for me to consider um, trying my own thing. Um, but trying my own thing is terrifying. You know, you finish your MBA, or uh, at the time I finished my, uh, my Lean Six Sigma, I got my black belt, I got my PMP, I did all these designations trying to round out my professional um, um, background. Um, and subsequently was like, well, maybe this isn't right for me. This is what I, what I wanted to do. And, uh, and so it took, a lot of, it took a lot of convincing because you talk to you know, your friends about it, you talk to your, you know, your family about it, and you know, trying to move into something that's high risk, questionable whether or not you're gonna get rewarded for it at all, is um, no one's gonna tell you to do it. In fact, most people will tell you not to do it. Um, and they tell you not to do it because if they fail, if you fail, they certainly don't want it to be their responsibility. But, but the other thing is they probably didn't go through it themselves as well. So they don't know how it feels like to actually start a company and kind of go through that process. And, and for me, I think when I think back to sort of the first five years of my career, a lot of it was looking for trying to find the inspiration for someone to give me the courage to say, okay, you know what? Let's try something different. Let's go out there and try to create something. Um, no one, there's no co-founders. There's no like, you know, it's like you deciding for yourself whether or not this is something that you want. Um, I was very lucky at the, the Ministry of Health. I actually um, met a mentor that, uh, that sort of pulled me aside in a meeting. I still remember this meeting and it was like, had a two hour uh, working session. And after the working session, I was, you know, I was doing my thing. I was like talking about process maps and, you know, all sorts of fun stuff and, and pulled me aside and, and said, what are you doing here? And I'm like, what do you mean what I'm doing? I'm trying to like make the organization better. I'm trying to streamline things. And, uh, and she said, that's not, that's not right for like, what you're doing, it's great, but it's, it's not. It's not what you want to do here. Like you can't. It's really difficult. To, and and literally everyone in the room, you glazed over a look. You can kind of tell when you're going through a, a, a presentation when people are either involved or they're completely kind of just just there presently, but not actually involved. And and so she pulled me out over. She she took me to lunch. She said you, you should really like think about doing something else. Like and I'm like you know like I've been thinking about it, but I can't convince myself to do it. And. Um, and, and really sort of pushed me to, to make that decision and decide that, hey, you know what, maybe it is something else. That, that, and I already known that I, I was really interested in real estate at the time. The, the one um, lucky thing over the course of the first five years was, um, obviously in 2008, 2009, there was the financial crisis, the meltdown. 
um, in the US, the, the, the Toronto market did take a little bit of a hit. We, we went down by about 15, 20% then um, at the time. And, uh, and I had just happened to buy my first property right at the bottom of that. Of that. And I think that was probably the, the, you know, looking back, it was a very lucky situation. It wasn't that I planned, I knew nothing about the real estate market at the time, and I just made the decision to, to buy a property. Um, but uh, but she was like, you, you're doing this thing on, on real estate. You should really like you. You seem to enjoy it. You're talking about it a lot, but here you are, like frustrated in in the large government organization. And and I think for me that was one of those things that it kind of like you, you have the aha moment. But are you gonna are you gonna jump on it and 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 move on it? And and still for me being that come from a, sort of a a family that didn't have a lot to to start from. I was like, you know what? I, I can't just quit and, and become a real estate agent. It just seemed absurd at the time. I've got my engineering degree, I've got all, all these things lined up. So, uh, so I decided, okay, why don't the backup be, I'll just try and do my MBA first and do this as a side hustle. So that was the, that was the play that I ended up convincing myself to do. Um, so I, around 2012, I actually uh, enrolled in the, in the MBA program at Shoe Lake. Did it part-time and did a part-time with the mindset that this is just the gap in my resume if I fail at starting this company, then I've got my MBA, I'm back to the corporate world afterwards. Um, it, so it was, a, it was never designed to be anything more than just something that you further, further your knowledge a little, build, build a network and go from there. And, and it worked out, I, I don't even know how to describe it, but it, it, it worked out really, really well in that you know the people that I, I did I did do the MBA with ultimately a lot of them are my clients now a lot of them I work with I build portfolios with I grow their and I, I manage their properties manage their assets but but more so throughout that process it just you know gave me the courage to say okay hey this is workable you can do real estate this is something that could be a career and more importantly if you can figure out how to tweak this to make it work for the specific industry that you're targeting you can make this something really unique in Toronto that, that doesn't exist in fact in Toronto. And, and that's, that's really how the evolution of real estate investing came into play. So I had, um, since, since buying the first property in, in 20, uh, 2008, um, I had a goal of looking at refinancing and purchasing a property every year. And that was my, so that was my personal goal and that was where I was trying to, to push uh, Push the growth, and as that was happening, I was noticing the entire portfolio, the values, the valuations were going up, and at the same time, here it is, like you know, I'm in class with a whole bunch of MBAs that are doing a real estate uh, program specifically, um, and all trying to invest in real estate. They're all working for the large uh, real estate players in Toronto now, um, and but they all want to own their own portfolio as well. So it worked out really well. It just said, okay, well, my knowledge is in investment properties. I've done it. I've practiced it, know the challenges that are happening there. Why don't I try this and, and, and grow this? And, and I started out just being an, an agent, uh, working with uh, individuals to help them buy their own investment properties. And, uh, and quickly I noticed, I was like, okay, so you're up to three properties and you're telling me that you don't have time? Like, yeah, I'm managing the properties, it's way too much work. There's just, everything breaks, tenants complain. There's all these things I need to do and I really can't, I can't grow. I was like, yeah, I see that. I have the same problem. And I was just like, okay, well, if that's a problem for you and that's a problem for me and that's a problem with other clients who are getting to a larger portfolio, then we should, pro we should probably build this practice out and have this as part of the suite of services that we would provide an investor so that the investor, when they're coming in, they can grow and then they can archive and let the real estate actually do what it's supposed to do, which is to, to create passive income. Um, so I did that, and then clients that went from two to three properties went to four, five, six, seven properties. I was continuing to grow along the way, and it got to the point where I was like, okay, so now these guys have large assets. They need to manage them. They need to plan the taxes associated with how they're going to report this to CRA and deal with all these other things. They need to figure out how to continue to grow because the banks have all these stringent laws about how they lend and how many investment properties you can hold under this bank versus that bank, and how they look at your income differently depending on you know, whether or not you're full-time, you're self-employed, and all these other factors, right? So you start building all this this, mind, this knowledge pool of information that allows you to, to really focus in, in, in investment real estate. And, and that's really what it, what it got, got to, to the point where I, I just realized that, that that's the space that we need to be in. We need to create a, um, a, a solution, um, not just a service, but a solution for real estate investors 
to be able to own real estate and, and, and grow real estate passively. So that when they talk to you, they're like, I just wanna buy real estate as part of my overall investment strategy. You could buy it for them, you could do the tax planning for them, you can do the property management for them, you can do the leasing for them, you can renovate the buildings for them, you do everything. And so that solution was really, um, it, 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 it's for me and for, for the team, that's what really made the difference. And, and over the last um, three, four years, we've been um, sort of tweaking the, the, um, the, uh, the formula to make sure that it works for investors that we work with. Um, so that we can actually provide those services on a, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis at a high degree of quality. All our clients, great thing about me, you know, a lot of people, real estate agents, will tell you that you buy one house and you don't see the client for like 10 years because they're not going to buy a house in 10 years. But if you're buying investment properties and it works out, you're buying one every year. So I'm seeing these clients year after year, they're buying more properties with you, they're growing their portfolio, you're managing their portfolio, and you're kind of like, you're kind of there with them. You're growing along the way. You build friendships with these guys. These guys are, these guys are people that, that you're going to see on a regular basis. So it's really, really uh, fascinating to get to the point where you, it's it's well beyond just the transaction. There's a trust element associated with it, and a great deal comes up that is two, three million dollars. That hey, this client can't do, and that client can't do. Maybe you do it as a group. Um, so there's really fascinating things that come out of that. But knowing how to set up joint ventures and all that kind of another conversation. That's a that's also a skill set to kind of pick up along the way. Basically, the, the gap that I found in the real estate market was that um, you had a very uncoordinated system. Um, so, you know, looking at it from an engineering perspective, um, I tried to compare it. I, I use this analogy to compare, but you've you know, seen kids playing hockey, soccer, whatever it is, they all just chase after the ball and you just see a throng of children just running towards that. And it's not really strategic, it's not really coordinated. Real estate in Toronto, it's exactly the same. <laughs> it's exactly, it's absolute chaos. So the system isn't set up for uh, people to work as teams. Agents are compensated individually, not as a group. So they act solely to do their best job to provide their, um, to provide their clients with the best knowledge that they can. But that's so limiting. To be an agent, you don't need to have a, a substantial academic background, you need to pass a few exams, and you, you go in with that perspective, and you don't have a, full, uh, uh, a real grasp of all the different elements of, of real estate. And in the meantime, you're selling a person, one person, a $5 million mansion, and another person, a $400,000 pre-construction condo. They're completely different things. You know, and if you're gonna go sell someone a cottage, then after that, it just you don't have the training for it, but to be qualified for it is fairly easy um, in in uh, in Ontario. And so the, the challenge is when you're looking at a game that's played like this in 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 Ontario and Toronto specifically, you, you see it and it's absolutely chaotic from the top down. You're just like, how does this industry work like this? And so you start putting some structure around it. And for me, it was it was, it was saying, okay, so first of all, what is the game that we want to play? We're not going to play everything. We're not going to sell cottages. We're not going to sell luxury properties. We're not going to sell, you know, whatever it is that that we don't understand. We're going to ignore all those uh, those uh, those type of assets and focus on what we know best. You saw the map earlier where you see all the properties cluster around a certain a certain pocket. The idea is that you know that pocket better than anyone else, and you know that pocket because it gives you the best investment returns. And so, from my perspective, it's always been okay. So now you understand the numbers. You understand the rules of engagement, and now you gotta, you gotta dig 10 levels deeper than that. You gotta understand how landlord and tenant board works. You gotta understand how every aspect of that, of that business looks like, that investment business looks like. And you gotta build the competencies around. You gotta have the right team. So you gotta have paralegals available to support you as needed. You gotta have contractors who can renovate the buildings and so forth. And that's really the way that we kind of looked at real estate. We said, okay, we don't wanna be a single guy who's running around just closing deals, um, the one-off deals here and there, we said, okay, we wanna be a team that can work together, that have like different strengths to be able to advise our clients better. Someone knows leasing better, tell them how much it's gonna, how much these lease rates might look like. Someone knows the investment side better, someone knows the renovation side better, and bring all those disciplines together so when we're advising a client, they have that much more information. It's still not perfect, but it's certainly a lot better than doing it as one person. Um, and that's really been what's really created a lot of success for us. And then once you've got a team, you can really do a lot of things to kind of call it, um, call
call it win by having other people support you. Um, a lot of deals that we've worked on didn't work for so-and-so, it could go to this person because this person has a similar priority or something that might work for it. So a lot of that conversation happens in-house and we can actually create a lot of opportunities for investors. Um, and the last piece is understanding you know, what the goals are and what the leading indicators are. One of the books uh, that I still, I still love to date um, that I, you know, that's really changed the way that we work in our office is a um, book called Four Disciplines of Execution. Have you guys heard of it? Never heard of it. Yeah, uh, it's a really good book. Um, um, so the book is uh, is all about how to look at winning differently. A lot of us look at winning as in hockey, it's who scores the goal. Um, you know, that person that scores a goal, they, you know, they won essentially. Won in the sense that they they completed what the objective of the game was. But scoring the goal is not actually, if you think about it, that's, that shouldn't be the, the measure that you're using to measure success. A lot of the time it's whether or not you have the puck in your possession to start. And that's the focus of the game. How do you make sure that you have puck possession? And then from there, if you could increase your probability of having a puck possession, your likelihood of scoring a goal goes up substantially. It's all like some levels of probability and likelihood and all that kind of things. And basically when we work with our clients, it's the same mindset. It's not about closing the deal. Like people gravitate towards closing the deal, making the making the deal work too much, and it's it's it really throws off the business because then you're just chasing the deal. It's all about the behaviors of hey, every day I'm supposed to do a, a detailed search for a client. I'm supposed to look for investment properties for them that fit their unique criteria. I need to follow up with the agents to figure out what's going on with that property and what's happened with it, and decide whether or not that property is a good fit. And if you don't do all that pre-work, the likelihood of you scoring the goal or closing the deal in this case, it's just not gonna happen. So we only track towards the homework that's being done. We don't actually track towards whether or not the deal was closed. And that mindset and how that manifests itself in the company dynamically changes how, how you do your work. Because you're not worried about winning. You're worried about something that you can control, which is doing the work that will likely lead you to win. So a very different mindset, but those, those are things that, that we've kind of taken in, in the team to kind of move forward. Any questions, comments, thoughts? What was no. the name of the book again? Uh, Four Disciplines of Execution. Yeah, it's a really, really good book. Um, it's one of those books that, especially when you're coming, I think it's a, one of those like baseline books that you don't really get told to read in university, but then you come out and you start working, you're like, holy crap, this book really has a lot of good insights in it. To, to allow you to focus on what's more important as opposed to chasing, you know, the thing that everyone is chasing as well at the same time. So, uh, if you get the next slide, I'm trying to see what else we have here. So, um, so I talked a little bit about a company. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we're unique um, and and what we've done to really create that the right culture and the right uh, um, system for our, our, our for the team. The 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 way that we've grown. Number one is by differentiating. I talked about how we just focus on investments. But what I didn't talk about is not only are we focused on investments, we provide really good value in that process of investing. So typically a, an agent that you'd be working with only buys you the property and you kind of take care of, see you later, right? With the clients that we work with, we purchase the property for them and the first time around we lease it, to, we lease it out for them for free. And so that's the hook. So you get in, we completely take that whole process of leasing off your off your hands, you get the tenants in and you get that experience that you want, which is like, wow, there's very little headache. And here I here I have tenants and the properties is, is making money at this point. Um, so we did that to really differentiate ourselves um, in, in, in that we really wanted to focus on creating the, the and, and moving through the entire value chain of, of um, real estate investments. Um, and alongside that, we were always listening to our clients. So our clients are asking us, hey, we needed accounting work. We needed, we needed to figure out, okay, we're refinancing now and we've got X number of three or four investment properties. How do we restructure our portfolio to allow us to not only buy the property that we want to live in, but buy two more investment properties along the way? And so that's a problem that you know, we have to be able to sit back, think about it and solve. And, and so a lot of it is, is then looking at that and saying, okay, how do we actually then build a system? Well, what we do is we actually meet with all the mortgage brokers across, uh, across all the major banks. So we know a contact at a senior level with all the major banks and we have, we're phone call away conversation with, with all the major banks to figure out what their unique criteria is. 
CIBC will lend on investment properties at a certain rate. BMO would look at it differently. TD would allow you up to X number of properties, right? So all of the banks have a different underwriting policy and it became our job to make sure that the clients who are working with us know which bank to go through. Be surprised how many times someone just walks into the bank and says, the bank says no, and then, and then they come back to us and like, they told us we can't get anything. I'm like, oh, did you talk to this bank? Well, that's, it's because they structure the rental program like this, you need to talk to this bank. And, and so creating those types of avenues where traditional agents were not looking to was a big part of how we've been able to kind of to, to, to focus on the client and, and build that customer experience. Um, the last thing is, you know, we're, two years ago, two, three years ago, we were a team of three people. Now we're, now we're, now we're eight. Um, and we're growing, we got a, you know, we've uh, got a couple new hires that are joining in, in January as well. So the difference really between the company now and where it's going to be is really how the group is going to work together. I think we're still going to grow fairly quickly over the next year or two up to sort of 50, 20 people. And that's the size that I've always told the team that we want to be at. Um, but now we've got a good team and we've got to keep the team tight and we've got to work together, trust one another and be able to invest in projects and do all that stuff together. So a lot of it, a big part of it this year to, to start, start at that was doing that co-investment with the team. So um, everyone on the team is invested in the deal together and we're all watching this project kind of go from beginning all the way to end. Everyone's building that skill set. everyone's building that understanding how to, how to make investment properties work. And through that, we're working tighter as a, as a group. And as Shanna mentioned, you just be, you, you're just not just co-workers at that point. It's a small company, it's a, it's a family. That's how it feels like to work in a company like that, where everyone's, you get the calls at 11 p.m. because someone has some issue with the property and someone needs to back them up, and it's just the reality of a small company. Uh, but your impact makes a huge difference in a small company versus, you know, being kind of hidden away a little bit if you're with a larger organization. Mm -hmm. Jump to, is there one more? I think that might be it. No, there's yep. one more. Yeah, okay. So uh, so this is the last slide I have for today. I just, I just wanted you guys to have a little bit of a takeaway. Um, and I just thought back in the, the, the last sort of, um, the last sort of 12 years I've been doing this and getting into real estate and all that kind of stuff. And I thought it would be good. To, to, to give you guys this, this as a takeaway. Number one, I mean, we already talked about this, work hard now, like now being like, as like now in school, I know you guys are working really hard because I went through the program and it was painful. <laughs> um, but, uh, but more so, um, even after, I think, you know, those habits that you build in engineering, super, super useful. It, it's, you know, I'm not gonna go comparing disciplines, but I think it's one of those things where you come out with the ability to work so much harder, so much more efficiently because you have you have all these competing priorities. Use that to your advantage, don't lose that, especially early in your career. Um, the second thing I hear is take risks. Uh, I, I definitely took a few risks along the way. I think, you know, uh, most of the, uh, most of the, you know, it's, it, I say it, I say it like a lot of the clients I work with, are struggling now because it's it's one of those things where they wish they took the risk to go into a startup or to to try something on their own earlier. Um, it becomes harder and harder, especially when you have you know a decent salary and you know you have a mortgage payment and two kids running around at home. It becomes very hard at that point. So um, make mistakes early and try things and be be comfortable, but learn as much as you can um, and believe in yourself because I think that that. No one's gonna, like I got really lucky, I was in the ministry when someone kind of pulled me aside and like gave me a little wake up call, uh, but not everyone's, not everyone's gonna get that and you're gonna have to give it to yourself to, to kind of say, hey, is this what I wanna do? Am I gonna spend the next 20, 30, 25 years doing this type of work or am I gonna make the decision to change it up? And what does that mean? Um, and the last thing is, um, this is one, this is one that I think for me was a big realization more so, this is more recent actually, is, is finding your unique talents. I think in your, your the, the stage in career that you guys are at right now where you're just finishing university, you're still figuring, you're figuring things out. You don't know what you're good at entirely. You're trying a lot of different things. Like jump into things and see if you're good at them. And if you are good at them, build on that, is what I would say. Because if, the first thing is not trying at all, which you don't want to do. You want to try, work on things, build on it, and then find out if it's good for you. Like I didn't, like if you asked me, I was like, heavy into healthcare, I loved process mm -hmm. improvement, I, I did Lean Six Sigma, and I was just all in with the industrial engineering type of work that I was doing, and, 
and and real estate kind of just came by fluke. It wasn't something that I that I that I said I wanted to be in real estate investment. I run a real estate investment company. It just it just kind of built itself that way where I was like, okay, I was making some good decisions. It worked out. I liked it, and I can get paid doing something that I like to do. So when you think about that, um, the hedgehog concept from the book Good to Great it talks a lot about that. It's finding that that you know Venn diagram, that that intersection between what you're good at doing, what you're going to get paid at doing, and what you're passionate about. Uh, and if you could find that sweet spot in between, it won't feel like work. It'll be long hours, but you'll enjoy it. And I think that's that's the thing that I probably look back down and I said, yeah, like you know, I, I, there are definitely weeks where I'm working 80. 80 hours, 90 hour weeks, but totally worth it because of what it's allowed me to, to do within the team, within my family, and, and as I'm moving forward with my career as well.